it's great to be with you all um, today. And so we're going to, we have a while, so I'm going to kind of talk about a few topics along the way. And we're going to start, my title of my talk is a plant-based diet and cardiovascular health. Um, and these are my disclosures. So, you know, like many of the uh, speakers here and many of, of the physician or, or medically trained people here in, in the audience, you know, I learned a lot along the way about diagnosis, treatment of disease, lots of really from wonderful people, lots of wonderful information, but I really didn't learn much about nutrition and prevention of disease. And that's unfortunately a common theme and things are changing um, thanks to conferences like this and, and many of you. Um, and <clears throat> so there's actually an interesting study by Dr. DeVries where they ask cardiologists, you know, do you think you know, nutrition lifestyle is important? Most of nutrition, do you think nutrition is important for preventing disease? And like 90% of them said yes. And they said, uh, they asked, you know, how many of you feel comfortable counseling patients about it? And I forget the exact number, but it was like, you know, something like 2%, like something ridiculous. So unfortunately the message isn't quite getting out there yet enough in medical training, but times are changing. Uh, I get to give the second year preventive cardiology annual lecture to the second year medical students at Einstein. And I, of course, weave in a lot about nutrition and diet into that. And I know that that's happening in many other institutions and many other platforms. So things are changing, but we're nowhere near where we need to be. And I have a few cases I could talk about. Um, and I think I'll talk about a couple of them later. This is one I've talked about before. And would love to share. It's a great kind of launching point for talking about the impact of plant-based nutrition. Um, and I also want to give a shout out to the speaker just before me, Dr. Esselstyn, uh, who, of course, every, needs no introduction and everyone knows here. Uh, he's um, uh, an incredible um, teacher, clinician, researcher, uh, is a real friend and mentor uh, of mine and to me. I'm extremely grateful for his support, information, guidance. And, you know, he, with, without him and his, his family, you know, our program really would be nowhere near as established as it has been today. Uh, so um, he's been, and, you know, his work really helped to launch the kinds of work that we're doing at Montefiore. So thank you, Dr. Esselstyn. So this patient um, is about 60 years old, and he started to have chest pain, angina. And he would get it sometimes even sitting still, sometimes walking a few blocks. And he went to go see his primary care doc. And he told his primary care doc, hey, you know, I'm, I don't want to take any medications and I don't want to do any procedures, invasive procedures. And, you know, it's the patient's the boss, as long as there's an informed decision about it, you know, at the end of the day, the patient's the boss. And of course, when we're preventing and, and trying to treat patients, prevent disease and try to treat patients, we use all of the above, lifestyle change and medications when indicated. But at the end of the day, the patient's the boss. This patient did not want to do either one of those, which is fine. Um, and he started having chest discomfort. This, the primary care doctor did a stress test, which was positive. And it's only really in medicine that the word positive means something negative. And so it showed that there was cholesterol blockages in the blood vessels that feed his heart with blood. Um, and so his cardiologist sent, or his uh, primary care doctor sent him to us, and you can see the baseline uh, vitals that he had. He, he was a little overweight, his blood pressure was a little bit up, his LDL cholesterol was a little bit high. He could walk like one or three blocks and he would stop because he got chest pain. And so um, at that point, he wasn't interested in statins or aspirin and you know, those would be certainly indicated in somebody uh, like this. But at any rate, uh, what he did is he adopted a whole food or smartly processed, minimally processed plant-based diet. And what we're going to do is we're going to circle back to him a little later in the talk and see how he did. And so heart and blood vessel disease is the leading cause of death in the U.S. A couple of heart attacks happen every minute in the US, so I don't know, we've been speaking for five minutes of 10 heart attacks so far. It is by far 
uh, well, it is the number one killer of adult men and adult women in the U.S. And women are about six to seven times more likely to die from heart and blood vessel disease than they are from breast cancer. So clearly you do not want either one, but it highlights the epidemiologic importance of heart disease in women. It's a very costly disease process uh, as well, and it just keeps going up year after year. And unfortunately, you know, as Dr. Esselstyn describes well, it is a process that starts when we're very young, and there's a pathology study of kids um, who died for other reasons and uh, not heart reasons. And they looked at their coronary arteries. And 65% of these kids between 12 and 14 years of age had early signs of coronary artery disease or cholesterol disease in the blood vessels that feed the heart with blood. Um, that's a lot. I mean, I'm sure most of you listening here are older than 12. Um, and then of course, there are multiple other famous pathology studies. Some of our, our veterans, those who died in the Korean and Vietnam War wars, they you know, are soldiers, uh, they are in the prime of life, some of them you know, 20 years old, uh, and a very large percentage of them had overt coronary artery disease that you can just see. And in a, in a more recent study, although not super recent, uh, in consecutive trauma victims, the mean age is 26, 78% of them had overt coronary artery disease. It's pretty unfortunate. So this is common. Um, and as you well know, uh, atherosclerosis can start when, this is, a, this is a blood vessel, this is the heart here, this is a blood vessel. This is the center of the blood vessel where the blood flows. And this, of course, this inner lining here, that's the endothelial cell. We want to treat that well. It's like wallpaper, the inner lining of the blood vessel. And what can happen is these endothelial cells can become injured from smoking, inflammation, pollution, toxic Western diet. And when that happens, these little cholesterol particles here can burrow across into the wall of the artery where they can become oxidized and pro-inflammatory, kind of like a splinter. It gets all red and inflamed in your finger, but the same kind of thing here, except in the blood vessel, the wall of the blood vessel. And that creates inflammation. More cells come in. The endothelial cells get sicker. More cholesterol particles burrow across, and it snowballs. And then the only thing that separates the blood, or the blood flows from all of this cholesterol plaque with lots of procoagulant factors and inflammatory factors is of course the very thin fibrous cap, which with all this oxidative stress and inflammation can become weaker and weaker over time. And so one random Tuesday afternoon, that fibrous cap cracks and all of this cholesterol plaque then touches the blood and the blood can clot off no more blood flow to the heart muscle. So if it clots off here, right there, the rest of this artery, no more blood flow, no more blood to the heart. This is a histologic picture of that. And you can see here's a blood vessel and here's all that cholesterol plaque. Here's that really thin fibrous cap, it cracks. And then you can see a clot develop, heart attack. This person obviously died. This is a picture of a heart right here. This is a coronary artery, one of the blood vessels that feeds the heart with blood. And you can see here that there was a fibrous cap ruptured and a clot developed in the coronary artery. No more blood flow and this person died from their heart attack. So that's bad news, but there really is an incredible opportunity for all of you and all of us, and frankly, everyone, to turn it around. So there is a really wonderful study, the Inner Heart Study, that was published in 2004 in Lancet. And that showed that about 90% of the risk for MI or myocardial infarction heart attack can be accounted for by the following nine risk factors. And I have little asterisks by them ones that are basically diet or, or 
impacted by diet. So abnormal lipids, smoking, high blood pressure, diabetes, abdominal obesity, psychosocial factors. And actually, interesting, interestingly, we'll look at a little bit of data how, how you eat can improve mood, <clears throat> consumption of fruits and vegetables, alcohol, although we should touch on that because the evidence supporting that is getting much weaker, in fact, almost gone for cardiovascular health. Uh, certainly there's no benefit for cancer and regular physical activity. Um, and this is a really cool study by Dr. Bundy. And what Dr. Bundy tried to do is kind of estimate, there's, there's something called American Heart Association Simple 7 or Life Simple 7. That includes smoking, body mass index, physical activity, a healthy diet score, total cholesterol, blood pressure, and hemoglobin A1C. And one of the goals of the American Heart Association was to try <clears throat> and optimize these risk factors nas internationally, or for, well, nationally more specifically. Of course, that has failed miserably. Um, but the, what this particular study did was they classified Life Simple 7 to people of three groups. And if you look here, for example, at the healthy diet score, they looked at ideal, intermediate, and poor healthy diet score. And in order to be in this particular analysis to have an ideal diet, you had to consume four or five of the following components that I'll mention, and poor was zero or one. So those five components in this study was four and a half servings of fruits and vegetables a day, at least, three servings of whole grains a day, at least, low salt consumption, fatty fish two or more times a week, uh, and low sugar sweetened beverage consumption. So if you had four or five of those in this study, you were considered to have an ideal dietary pattern. And just of note, 0.7% of the US in this study had an ideal dietary pattern. 75% had a poor dietary pattern. So people spend a lot of time arguing about, is this, you know, this diet's 99% perfect, this diet's 98% perfect. That is largely a distraction from a societal level because we are not within a mile of what is 98% perfect. So um, just keep that theme in mind. Anyway, so this is a really cool study. And what they found is they looked at total cardiovascular health score. And you can, so if you had an ideal, whatever measure, you got two points, intermediate one, poor zero. And <clears throat> they defined a high cardiovascular health score as 12 to 14 points and low as zero to eight points. About 7% of the US had high cardiovascular health, incorporating life simple seven. And about 59% and low. We're not doing well. This study is from 2020.